Hello everyone and welcome to my 10,000 subscribers Q&A and honestly I am still amazed by that number and I'm really grateful for every one of you who is watching my humble videos and is leaving nice comments. That really means a lot to me and I really appreciate it. I was really worried that no one would leave a question and I would have to make up strange questions myself just to look cool. But thankfully lots of you left me nice questions and I already read through them and I tried to categorize them a little bit by topic. It's not so easy to really clearly separate them but I tried. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about my husband is doing, since many of you asked about it. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what we do for a Let's try this. So the first question would be, how are you doing? Thank you, I'm doing kind of great. Unfortunately, I was a little bit sick over the holidays. Maybe you can still hear it from my voice. But other than that, life is good and I hope yours too. And next, many of you were asking how my husband is doing. And thanks so much for that. You made him really happy. In fact, I always get to hear since weeks now that actually people like him much more than me. So this has been fun. So there have been some up and downs in the last few months, but overall we are very positive. So at the moment, every few months, we have to do a lot of checks. So from the cancer he had in his kidney a few years ago, he's in full remission and the head also looks good, but we're going to have the next check in a few weeks. But we are very hopeful that things will slowly go back to normal. And hopefully we can reduce the amount of checks and hopefully he will soon be allowed to drive again. So yeah, we're hoping for the best. Okay, the next question is, how do you stay positive when things are tough? And honestly, oh, I don't. <laughs> I had nervous breakdowns, I cried my eyes out and um, it was not easy, especially during those days where we had to wait in Brazil and it was not clear if they would fly him out or what we're supposed to do. So uh, no, I don't always uh, stay positive. But once this phase is over, honestly, I think it's nothing that I can change and if, what we're not hoping, but if our life together is shorter than we would want it to be, then at least we should make the best out of it. And just sitting at home and crying and being desperate over his health situation is not working or would be a waste of time in my opinion. So we just try to make the best of it. And luckily Everson also thinks the same. So next let's move on to kind of work-related and YouTube-related questions. So the first question is, I want to know what is the hardest thing about starting your YouTube channel and how you overcame it. <laughs> so <laughs> basically I think I have two things that I struggled with. The first one would be me <laughs> because <laughs> I am not a very good presenter. It's very difficult for me. I think now 60 videos in I got a little bit of a hang of it but it's just a torture almost every time I have to do it. I don't know, at the same time I enjoy doing it, but on the other hand it's uh, terrible. <laughs> and um, maybe there's so many things that influence that. For example, English is not my first language, so sometimes I just struggle because I just sometimes say stuff that is not grammatically correct and then I try to correct it and then I get all confused and then I have to repeat the whole thing. Also, sometimes I think I should be more enthusiastic when presenting things because so many other people on YouTube, they're like always yelling and throwing things around and full, and full of enthusiasm, but uh, that's not me. But honestly, I receive many comments of people saying that they enjoy my videos because they are so calm and I kind of take that as a sign that I'm going in the right direction with this. And another thing that I'm struggling with is, especially now that the channel is growing a little bit, there are many requests for people who want to sponsor videos and stuff. But I don't know if that's just something I'm feeling, but I often feel like many YouTubers, once they get to a certain size and they start taking sponsorships in, it just feels so fake. I don't know, I always kind of feel I lose my trust to them. So at the moment I'm not doing any of those and I'm honestly not knowing if I ever will. The money would be nice obviously but on the other hand I really don't want to be a sellout creator so yeah 
And the second big thing that I'm struggling with is kind of the technical side of things. Um, I'm traveling most of the time. I only have a small bag, so I don't have room for like tons of equipment. And at the same time, I have to kind of make things work wherever I am. And I'm often in other people's houses and I try to be respectful of their privacy and stuff. So I don't have a studio. I don't have tons of equipment and just making this work to look kind of nice-ish <laughs> is sometimes really a struggle for me. But I think I learned a lot in that regard over the two years. At least I hope it looks a little bit better and sounds a little bit better. And actually Everson and me were already thinking of making a second YouTube channel, kind of a project of the two of us together, where we go more into the creator tutorial side of things, show how we do it, what gear we bring, because I think we are in a kind of unique situation in that regard and maybe others are in the same situation or just don't have the money and space at home to invest into lots of equipment. So the next question also goes more or less in the same direction. I'm also interested in learning more about your YouTube journey. Would you recommend it? Is it difficult? I guess what are the pros and cons and how long did it take you to get a bit of following? So would I recommend it? Probably yes, when you do it for the right reasons and you find something that you enjoy talking about. As I mentioned, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with YouTube because I'm not that big of a fan of presenting and being on camera. I really struggle with that. But on the other hand, I just enjoy talking about minimalist packing and all those things so much. And at home, no one wants to listen to me going on about packing and packing cubes and all those things anymore. So I'm very grateful that there's people out there interested in the same thing. So for me, yes, I would recommend it. But only, as I said, if you find something that you're really passionate about. Is it difficult? Yes. <laughs> I guess, what are the pros and cons? The pros for me are really that I'm able to connect with other like-minded people out there. Another thing that has been very nice, especially in the last few months that we had to spend so much time dealing with Everson's health issues, is the passive income. I mean, I'm not getting rich from YouTube, but it was a little bit that at least kept us fed. There's not too many cons for me, in my opinion. The biggest one is probably that you have to invest a lot of time, especially in the beginning, until you gain some traction. It took me a long time to get to this, which probably also answers your next question. I think I'm now more than two and a half years in. I mean, granted, I did not post too many videos. I think I'm at 60 videos now, but it takes a long time to slowly grow. And sometimes the algorithm is very frustrating. So the next question is, what are your thoughts on your decision for full-time travel now? Given some of the challenges you have faced, have you questioned it? No, uh, honestly, we never questioned it. That's also the reason why we did not get an apartment back home in Austria now, because then you immediately have to sign a rental contract for a few years, which we really don't want. We kind of hope that we can continue more or less the way we did with a few alterations. So the challenges that we faced are just little bumps in the road, but they don't make our plans impossible at the moment. And then the next question is, has your traveling lifestyle meant you have lost connections with old friends or lost a sense of community? I would say not necessarily the traveling, because we always made an effort to meet with everybody and reunite once we are here. And honestly, people are busy. So even before, when we were living here, we were probably not seeing them much more often than we did now. We also had like regular group phone calls with our friends, which is probably something we were used to during the lockdown times anyways. So no, I would not say that traveling really made me lose this. What gave it a little bit of a temper though was the cancer situation of Everson, but uh, yeah, that's another story. But overall, I think we have a nice network of great friends. And I think the sign of a good friend is that even though you probably don't talk to them for months or for years, when you meet again, you immediately hit it off where you left. And I'm very fortunate to have a few of those people in my life. So the next question. What do both of you do as your primary job? Oh, that's a long story. <laughs> we actually met at work a few years ago. We were working for a manufacturer of digital textile printing machines. I was the head of marketing and also in R&D and Everson was in R&D. 
So we got to do lots of projects together and also train customers and stuff. And at some point we both were a little bit overworked and we just decided that we will go do it on our own. And we kind of wanted to become trainers for digital textile printing. But then obviously Corona came and all those things and ugh, it did not work out the way we planned. So nowadays we kind of do whatever we find. So we still have some online courses and stuff, but we also write articles for international industry magazines. We also have obviously this YouTube channel who brings in a little bit of income between the two of us. We speak four languages, so we do lots of translations and subtitles and articles. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but Everson also translates very nicely all my subtitles into Spanish and Portuguese all the time. So yeah, we kind of do whatever comes our way and actually we enjoy it very much. So we're not getting rich, but we're comfortably traveling. So the next question, What's your digital nomad story? How do you get to a point where you were both able to travel full time? I don't think we ever got to this point where we were really able to do it. I think if we would still wait for this point where we have enough money saved up to feel really comfortable with it, we would probably not doing it yet. But at some point in the past, especially Everson had his first cancer, we just did the calculations. And honestly, I think we're actually saving some money since we're traveling, since we don't have to pay for an apartment anymore. We don't have any debt. We have a car that's now 10 years old, so we really have no huge payments. And when you travel to other parts of the world, the uh, cost of living is cheaper than in Austria. So actually we kind of just did the jump and did not think too much about it. But we have a few security systems in line that give us a lot of peace of mind. So for example, we have some savings and we obviously have some income, even though it fluctuates. And we defined a certain number of our savings until then we go. If we would drop underneath that, we would both probably come home or settle down somewhere and try to find normal jobs again. The other one is that we are on a very strict budget. And just looking at the budget and at the savings, we always know how many years or months we would survive, even if we would not earn a single cent. And the next two things is that we're kind of secure because we have health insurance and we also are already paying for our pension. Those two things come more or less included in the package as Austrians. But on the other hand, we have to almost give up 50% of our income. But just knowing that those two things are in place gives us also a lot of peace of mind. So we are not rich. We're far from it. We're just very frugal. Okay, next question. What secrets can you share on generating passive income for gaining more freedoms? Oof, that's, that's a difficult question. And I think passive income is the best thing you can do to gain freedom. That being said, I think that generating passive income was a lot easier 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I don't know if I ever mentioned it, but like 15 years ago when I did my master's degree, it was kind of the start of the whole print on demand thing. And I drew one t-shirt that sold so much that actually it um, paid for my whole master's degree. So <laughs> I was very lucky there. And the best thing was that actually I drew this thing on an unpaid internship that I was forced to do. And I was very pissed off because there was no one there who would teach me anything. So basically I was there as a full-blown employee and I had to do everything for free. So in one of my times where it was less busy there, I drew this design and then I earned a lot of money with it. So yeah, I was very uh, happy about that. But nowadays I think all those platforms are so saturated and now with AI and everything, it's getting more and more difficult. If you want to go on a more passive income journey, then you have to be prepared to really go with the flow and adjust over time. Because with most passive income, you're always really up to the mercy of those companies you're working with. And if from one day to another they decide to change, then it can be a big blow for the creators. So for example, I have a few videos up where I talk about my courses that I had on Skillshare and my income there. And obviously they changed their payment structure and it was a big blow for most creators. So you kind of have to be able to adapt to those things. So now let's move on to the more travel related questions. And the first one would be, how long do you and Everson plan on traveling? Um, the answer is easy, as long as we can. 
we kind of have this uh, vague dream of one day settling down in a rural area in Spain with a little house and some olive trees around, but we hope that this is still a few years away and that we can travel as much as we can. So the next question is, what countries have you traveled to? And uh, that's a, that would be a long list probably. Obviously I've been all over Europe because it's just so easy. I spent a year in the US when I was 19 and from there I traveled to several places in the Bahamas and the Virgin Islands and those kind of things. And I spent a lot of time in South America, especially in Brazil, because that's where my husband is originally from. So those are the main countries I've traveled to. But now that goes kind of hand in hand with the next questions. What countries would you like to visit in the next two years? Which countries are on your list to visit? And do you and Everson plan on coming to Australia? So yes, uh, both of us would like to go to Australia. It's on our bucket list, also New Zealand. I have never been to Asia. I really would like to go. And then obviously there's lots of places that I'm dreaming of. Canada, I really want to go Canada. I want to go see Patagonia in Argentina. I also want to go to Iceland very bad to see the Aurora Borealis. Never seen it. But that being said, at the moment, I am not brave enough to travel with him to very remote destinations. So we're kind of staying in the area and we're planning on going to Spain now February, March for two months. Then we come home. Then we would like to go to Scotland and probably hike on the West Highland Way. Then afterwards, we have this vague idea of going for the summer to Norway and more up north, maybe with a roof tent on the car. We have not decided that yet. And then towards the end of the year, if things get more stable, then we kind of have this dream of going to Asia for the winter. But we'll see. <laughs> but the list is long. So the next question is, what was the first country you remember visiting as a child? And honestly, I did not get to travel too much as a child. I was raised by a single mother together with my brother and we just did not have... Well, that was not really a thing in my family. But on the other hand, I was very lucky because I got to spend every summer in the remote farmhouse in the mountains where we had no electricity and no running water and I had the best time of my life there. I think I was 14 or 15 when I really went on my first vacation and I got to see the ocean for the first time. So I don't have too many memories as a child. Apart from the memories when I was a child, because we're in Austria and it's very close to go to Germany and also Italy, it's just a few minutes drive away either side. <laughs> I remember as a child that we always had to cross the borders and you always had to exchange your pocket money, all those things. So the next question is, have you ever had a really bad TSA experience or somebody behaving badly on a flight? Someone behaving on a plane, not really. I've always been lucky that people are kind of kind with each other, except maybe one flight attendant. But that was on the, one of the first flights back from Brazil after the whole Corona thing happened. And they had the service reduced to a minimum and you could not choose your food and they served something that I could not identify. And I have some food intolerances, so I wanted to know what it is and she was very rude and did not kind of answer and just said, you eat it or not, it's not my problem. So I was like, okay. And they were nice enough to put us in the middle aisle in the two middle seats. So I really did not want to bother everyone around it with my stomach problems afterwards. So I did not eat it. But I thought that was kind of rude. And then bad TSA experience was actually on the same flight when we arrived in Frankfurt then. And I had to go to security again to go on my connection flight to Austria and then the guy at the security insisted that I have to take out every single cable. I mean I'm prepared with my laptop and my other electronics, I'm prepared with my fluids but I never had someone who wanted to see all the cables so it was kind of a mess um, to figure that out where I had them stuffed in my bag and I almost missed my flight. So the next question is um, what happened to your house sitting? Weren't you planning on doing some before traveling again? We usually combine house sitting with traveling. So we usually house sit in other countries. And in October, we went to France and Switzerland for house sitting. And now we're gonna go back to Spain in a month. So we're very excited. Now I have to drink a sip of water. 
before my voice totally goes away. <clears throat> okay, so let's come to the more packing related questions. And the next question would be, how tech changes affect your travel packing? Do you select technology that shares cabling so you can cut down in weight or find more items that can do double duty? Yes, yes, absolutely. I try to reduce my chargers to a minimum. I try to have the amount of cables I need to a minimum. And another thing that has been a game changer for me is that now since two and a half years, I'm traveling iPad only. So I don't have a computer anymore that I have to carry around. And that also saves me a lot of space and weight. <laughs> I was wondering, have you generally always been disorganized and prioritized simpler ways of doing things? Or is that a response to not being that way in your youth? <laughs> I, I love this question because uh, I have definitely not been like this in my youth and I'm still not like that. Everson always says as soon as I arrive somewhere, I turn this place, it looks like something exploded in there. <laughs> and I'm a very chaotic person, or I would prefer to say I'm a very creative person. But the only thing that really works for me to stay more organized is to have fewer things simplify everything as good as I can and have especially a dedicated place for that and that makes my life a lot more enjoyable and it makes me a lot less anxious and I otherwise I always lose everything and uh, yeah I'm a mess but now let's move on to the next question which would be how do you pack minimal with special events weddings etc especially how do you fit specialty shoes and suits and dresses I actually did a video a few months ago where I show what I packed for a wedding that I was invited to in the US and basically my dress was just a wrinkle-free dress that I could stuff into my backpack and that worked quite well but at that wedding I ended up wearing shoes from my mom which were kind of a little bit high heels but not too bad so they did not take up too much room. I think for guys for once that's a little bit more difficult because the stuff is just bigger. I guess. But I know that Everson, for example, has one button-down shirt that looks nice and also does not wrinkle that he usually brings to events like this. The next question is, do you use padlocks on your bag abroad? No, I kind of stopped using padlocks at all. Nowadays I just use those small S-beaners to clip the two zippers together to avoid them opening up but I don't use padlocks anymore. And honestly, I think nothing screams rich tourist than walking around with a huge backpack and a big padlock on it. So I have been fine not using them. Next question is how many credit and debit cards do you take abroad when you go? So I usually bring, I have one credit card from my Austrian bank that also has our travel insurance and everything on it. But I kind of use this card only as a backup card because the currency exchange rates is not so great. What I also bring, and I already did a video about that, is a WISE card and a Revolut card. And these are the two that I usually use during traveling to pay things in the local currencies because they have a better um, exchange rate. And then I usually just throw my regular bank card from Austria in somewhere safe, <laughs> uh, just as a backup. And those are the cards that I bring. So the next question refers to the video that I did where I talk about how I organize my seasonal capsule wardrobes. And um, the question is, in the special occasion packing cube, do you have any special seasonal clothes like Christmas pajamas? Uh, honestly, I don't because I don't wear Christmas pajamas. Uh, I have minimized my clothes very much. But honestly, if this is something that you enjoy wearing, then just please add them to this speciality packing cube or you can also make uh, another packing cube called seasonal clothes that make me happy. I think it only becomes problematic when you start to collect things that you never wear but as long as you have seasonal clothes in there that you enjoy wearing and you happily rediscover year after year and give them a use then you're doing great. So the next question is what do you think about life in Austria and do you think it is a good place to live? Yes, <laughs> I think I won the genetic lottery being born here in Austria. I think it's a very nice country, it's a very safe country. The people, especially in the area where I live in the mountains, are very nice. Obviously I don't agree with the politics here at the moment, especially all this uh, hatred towards refugees. 
But I think when you travel a lot and you see in which miserable conditions people really live and are left and are left there on their own, then you cannot really blame them for trying to find a better future for themselves. And also all the corruption that we have and all those things. So yeah, I think no country is hundred uh, percent good, but overall Austria is a pretty good place to live. I would say yes. And I would also never give up my Austrian citizenship and I really enjoy having an Austrian passport because that makes traveling really a lot easier. Okay, so the next question is, how do you organize items like umbrella, raincoat or swimming shorts? Additionally, how do you handle your tech gear? Do you have a separate storage bag for that? So yes, I usually have a separate storage bag for my tech gear. I already did a few videos about that. I will link it somewhere in the description. In terms of umbrella, raincoat or swimming shorts, I think you're referring at things that get wet. I travel with an umbrella and it's a very small one and it has a protective cover. So I usually just keep it in my bag somewhere. Swimming shorts, I just have usually one pair of swimwear with me. If it's wet and also my raincoat and I need to pack it because I'm on the move, then I usually just stuff it into my uh, dry bag that I have for washing clothes and just pack it and whenever I arrive at my destination I unpack it and let it dry again. And now let's move on to the last few questions. I would love to know more about how you plan your travels and accommodations. Do you stay in a place for a while? Any suggestions for the length of time that generally works well? When we're house sitting we kind of have to arrange the durations depending on the length we have between the house sits. But when we are not house sitting, we usually found that around one month works best for us. When we stay for that long, we usually like to book via Airbnb because they usually give you a very nice discount when you stay for a month. It's usually the same price as for 10 days or two weeks, but you can stay the whole month. So we had very good um, experience with that. And we also found that for ourselves, after like four to five weeks, we're kind of ready to move on. So this is kind of the duration that works very well for us. Do you look for accommodation based on a central location and the ability to cook? Uh, yes, ability to cook, definitely. Evers and me both enjoy cooking and it really helps keeping the costs down. We would not be able to afford going to a restaurant for a month or something. So that's important to us. And if we look for an accommodation based on a central location, it really depends on the trip. When we're traveling with the car in Europe, we usually like more remote destinations because we both really enjoy being in the nature. But when we're traveling with public transport, then we usually try to stay more central or in a place a little bit outside where we have good access to public transport. And the last question, do you use any particular app for booking your accommodation and travel? So yes, as I mentioned, I book a lot on Airbnb. For shorter destinations, I really enjoyed booking.com because of the feature that you can cancel for free in case you would need it. And probably my favorite thing to find accommodations is Trusted House Sitters, which is the website we use for house sitting. And I already did a video about that and I will also link it somewhere in the description. So yes, Thanks so much for all those lovely questions. I really enjoyed this, <clears throat> even though my voice is really starting to fade away now. <laughs> I'm sorry that this time the Q&A was not live. I'm honestly not brave enough to do that. Maybe we do that at 50,000 and then I have enough time to figure out how this is done. And yeah, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate you. I hope you're having a fantastic new year with lots of travel and I'll see you soon. Bye!